According to PwC's Women in Work Index, research indicates that the Middle East region loses $575 billion a year due to the barriers that exist to women's access to work. Globally, that's worse, $160 trillion, and World Economic Forum data suggests that at the current rate of change, it will take 217 years to close the gender gap. With International Women's Day upon us in 2021, I am delighted on AB Talks to be joined by Michelle King to unpack this. Now, Michelle is Senior Advisor to the UN Foundation's Girl Up Campaign. She's also a Managing Director of Berkeley University's Leadership Inclusion Academy. And she's also Managing Director of Equality Forward and a former Director of Inclusion at Netflix. Michelle, welcome to AB Talks. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Uh, Michelle, my first question. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have, in 2021, issued decrees which made it illegal to pay women better than men. This is something we have seen in other countries. My question to you is, these laudable step forward, step forwards help, but they're not the end-all solution. What have you seen around the world and what the impact of these laws when they're implemented? You know, I can't speak to legislation sort of specifically and the, and the impact of that. I think obviously mandating fair pay for sort of, you know, equal work makes a lot of sense um, and it's the right thing to do. I think the challenge with what we found is, you know, it's not always just the legislative requirements. We need companies. We can't wait for every country to put legislation in place. You know, we need every company to do the right thing. And what we found really works from a pay transparency um, perspective is really publishing your numbers. So organizations that, you know, make public commitments to close the gender gap when it comes to pay do that by being transparent about the pay gap. You know, there's never more of an incentive for a business to close the pay gap once they publish their data. And so organizations that do that, you know, we see um, them making real commitments and actually closing that gap in a relatively short period of time. And I actually reference that in my book, you know, why transparency is the key to closing the pay gap. I think the other thing that's important to note is the pay gap, you know, it's not the same for all women. It's compounded by effects of racism, you know, homophobia. We see that really play out. And so it's important for companies to understand, you know, what is the performance tax you're putting in place for women? How are you asking women to do more, be more, to advance at work? And how's that affecting their promotions and rewards in organizations? So for me, this is much more a management practice than it is a legislative issue. I mean, you've just sparked all sorts of questions for me there. Um, I, I was talking to, a, you talk about commitment and commitment to be transparent. I was talking to a colleague recently and she felt that International Women's Day is very important. But she also remarked that she felt it was becoming something that companies pay lip service to, almost a hallmark holiday type affair. What's your view of that? How important is International Women's Day and how, is important, how important is it that it doesn't get hijacked? I think this is such an important point and I'm almost thankful that you raised it because every year we have the International Women's Day theme, we have organisations talking about the theme, they hold events, they hold panels and nothing changes, no action is taken and I feel so passionately about this issue Scott that I've actually um, created a website with 100 actions for equality that's completely free that anybody can access. It's called 100actionsforequality.com and it is to take the theme, choose to challenge, which is this year's theme, and to convert it into actions that each of us can take. And I think the challenge with organizations when they come out, you know, once a year to talk about how committed they are to gender equality, but there's no behavioral change, there's no sort of substantive solutions, we don't see any gains for women, is that it's gaslighting. It's saying to women, you know, we really believe in you, we really believe in this issue of equality, but actually we're not going to do anything to, to change that. And it leaves women feeling like they're doing something wrong, you know, in terms of not advancing, because the organization is saying it's doing everything it can to create a level playing field. So this year, I think with Choose to Challenge, what would be great to see are organizations again, coming back to that transparency, being transparent about where your gaps are and you know where you're at on the journey. Every organization's on the journey and companies get so uncomfortable doing 
fakeness because they feel if they're honest about it, somehow that's going to make them look bad. But we all know their numbers. You know, we just look at their executive teams and we know where they're at. So I think organizations need to be more transparent about where they're at and what they're going to do to close all the gaps, whether it's at a leadership level or pay level, and even just, you know, how women are feeling valued in their organization. I think companies really need to do more and be transparent and share those actions each year to make IWD meaningful. It's, it's, I mean, I'm always fascinated by this, and I, I refer to that figure that I mentioned earlier, which is $575 billion being lost in this region. And you've written as well in the past about why gender equality benefits men and understanding the barriers for men. What I don't understand, and perhaps you can tell me this, why have companies not just looked at this from a pure bottom line basis? Put gender politics aside. If I'm an accountant running a business, surely the numbers make sense to do the right thing. I, you know, Scott, I'm not sure you're going to like my answer here. You know, yes, there is a very strong business case for equality, right? We know, we, and I actually say this, you know, the status of where we're at on the diversity inclusion um, sort of journey is that we have knowledge, but we lack understanding. And what I mean by that is we know there's a business case. So we know you increase gender diversity, you increase racial and ethnicity um, in your leadership teams, you're going to have high return, high productivity, higher innovation. And yes, it's a correlation. It's not a direct causation. But what we find is that more diverse teams are better teams. What enables that? Leadership makes a lot of sense. You have a diverse team in order to harness the benefits of that. You need leaders who can have people collaborate, who can work together, you know, bridge their differences, work across the cultural divide. And that requires inclusive leadership. The challenge I have with the argument that, you know, you need a business case in order to include people who don't look like you is it's inherently racist and misogynistic because there's no business case for white men. And it also does nothing to allow senior leaders to personally connect to this work you know there, there's no business case that's really going to encourage leaders to change but when to your point men realize that actually a more equal workplace serves to benefit them as individuals that it's a more effective way of leading and that it's actually the way to future proof your career suddenly there's something in it for them you know i often say d and i initiatives have failed men and they have because we haven't shared how the current state actually doesn't work for men even if you've advanced within it it's not what without a cost. And so for men, you know, there are tremendous challenges they face because of gender inequality. In fact, it's, you know, having a more equal society, probably one of the best things to ever have happened to them. You know, in cultures of equality, environments where employees feel like they can be themselves and will be valued for that, a study by Accenture shows that men are twice as likely to advance to senior leadership positions. Now, somebody that's good at maths might say, well, why is that? And it's because we're no longer advancing a small number of men that maybe fit this outdated 1950s leadership ideal, right? We're opening it up and we're valuing diversity and that's what this is about the quality is the freedom to be yourself and be valued for that and men need that freedom just as much as women is there i was interested because the uae had one of the few governments around the world that have quotas that make it mandatory for government boards to have women on them um, and they've been incredibly successful this whole push pull argument um, do you think that that kind of quota should be rolled out into the private sector what, what's your view so I, I don't know if you're asking this because you know it's a hot button, Scott, but um, I'm not a fan of quotas. And I think anybody who's read my book or heard me speak on this topic will, will know that. I, um, I, you know, I never used to have a strong opinion of quotas until I conducted my PhD research where I was really interviewing men and women from two different organizations, global organizations, throughout the organization, over 110 hours of interviews, you know, 10,000 data points. It's a lot of, of information and a survey of over 3,000 participants. So it's a huge amount of data. And from that, I really found that, you know, the number one barrier that men see to their advancement and fulfillment of work are d initiatives that are focused on women or advancing women like quotas. And what we find is for women who are put into those roles, they face tremendous scrutiny because they're viewed as tokens. They're not taken seriously. There's a lot of backlash, a lot of isolation, and it really affects their confidence. And I would be all for quotas if they worked, but they don't work. You know, that's the challenge. Women are 50% more likely to be replaced by a white male, irrespective of their performance. So it's not actually a sustainable solution. You can't cut, copy, and paste people into leadership roles if you don't know whether or not they're going to be 
valued. You know, for me, closures are like looking at the scoreboard, not the game. What we need to focus on is the lived experience. You know, if you're a senior leader listening to this and you want to go out and hire a racial and ethnic minority woman to make your DNI sort of numbers and strategy look good, you have no business doing that if you don't know what the lived experience of that woman is going to be like. If you don't know the challenges they're going to face, what are those barriers that I refer to, the challenges people face? Because environments, work environments specifically, don't value different. And that is every leader's job, you know, create an environment that values difference, understand the challenges women face, how that shows up differently for all women, and most importantly, how you need to show up as a leader every day to remove those obstacles. And if you don't know the challenges women face, please don't hire us because, you know, you're not going to create an environment that, that values us. How does an organization get started down this road then? Because I know you talked about, you know, the denial of inequality and they often the old saying that, you know, the first step is the hardest and but taking the first step. How does a company actually go, I have a problem here? How do they recognize that? How do they get started? Yeah, look, I mean, I talk a bit about the history in terms of understanding how we got here, more because I just find it interesting. As someone who's been at Eastern University for 13 years studying management and organizations, um, I just found it interesting that we ended up in environments that really value one type of individual to succeed. And if you look at the history, right, it, like back in the 1950s, organizations like Ford Motor Company and the management theories like Taylorism that really underpinned how organizations work, a lot of the design and theory that goes into organization or you know when it comes to policies processes practices and beliefs about what good looks like in organizations they're pretty much hardwired for a 1950s masculine ideal right someone who's dominant assertive aggressive competitive willing to make work the number one priority that is what we call a transactional way of leading and the problem with that command and control style is it doesn't really serve people today so in a COVID world you need leaders who can connect and then lead leaders who can create family friendly workplace practices you know and the the lack of that is why we're seeing two million women leave the workforce in the united states last year and every job lost in december being you know women and the reason for that is because we don't have leaders who can connect and then lead and what we call transformational leadership so leaders who are democratic empathetic caring and so the shift that needs to happen is not just you know around covid when we think about the future world of work and changes like ai you know uh, nanotechnology the internet of things robotics the fact is most of us are going to be working with people who don't look like like us and more importantly with machines and so you know the challenge for us is to think about how do you create a work environment where you can innovate where you can collaborate where you can think differently and that requires a transformational way of leading and so the shift is actually you know more of a necessity for men for men to deviate from that transactional way of of leading you know that's deviating from what could look like for men and so it's incredibly challenging i did a study separate from my phd really looking at you know what are the attributes that are required in the future world of work and both men and women in a study of 735 participants said it's things like emotional intelligence leading inclusively you know managing people to achieve outcomes those types of attributes and i said great out of the same list of 20 attributes how many do women have today? Um, you know, how many skills do women have today? Women have four out of the five skills that are required in the future world of work, and men have one. And that is because men are handcuffed to this outdated way of leading. And so, you know, they really do need the freedom to lead in a way that might be more democratic, might be more caring, might be more empathetic without being seen as less, you know, manly for it or being penalized by their peer group for leading in that way. And so, yes, we got here because organizations by and large were created by and for the same types of people they were male dominated that's not the workplace today and that importantly will not be the workplace of the future do we have a big opportunity here with coronavirus because that has accelerated the conversation around mental health in the workplace um, emotional intelligence leadership um, and the benefits of that because male or female there are plenty of employees out there who have suffered from what you say is the transactional leadership i hands down I, i've been a, a victim of that type of leadership myself as well um so do we have a, a big opportunity with the coronavirus because there's never been a bigger conversation about the need for emotional intelligence at the top of companies 
I have to be honest here, you know, what we see time and time again is this awareness raising. We've seen it right now with a lot of the anti-racism work on the back of George Floyd and Armand Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, um, you know, those terrible murders that took place last year in the United States. And, you know, that's raised a lot of awareness around issues of racism, just like the Me Too movement raised a lot of awareness around the issues of sexism. But my experience of it is after that awareness, there's fatigue. So what we find is people get tired, they get tired of the topic, they get tired of, you know, even now when I'm going for speaking arrangements, people will say to me, hey, Michelle, could you talk just not about the gender thing, like we're done with the gender thing, could you talk about, you know, another topic? And it's because people are tired, because what happens is with the awareness raising, everybody cares, suddenly there's a huge push, organisations and come out and say how committed they are, but nothing changes. And that is exactly what's happened with COVID. If you actually look at the statistics on gender inequality and where we're at today, we are in a terrible crisis when it comes to gender inequality. Two million women left the workforce in the United States, you know, and the pay gap likely this year will be greater than at any point. We've actually lost gains because women are leaving the workforce. And this crisis, this motherhood crisis, you know, they call it the she session in America, is absolutely critical. Women cannot work in environments that are not family friendly. We need leaders to lead. We need leaders to help with the work life integration. We need men at home, you know, to carry their load of invisible labor. And to a large extent, a lot of this is oblivious to most men. So I'll hear, well, isn't a COVID really great for gender equality? Absolutely not. In fact, what we find is men at home are spending more time with their children, yes, but actually doing less of the invisible labor around domestic care responsibilities than ever before. And so, you know, there's tremendous challenges both on the home front and on the work front when it comes to gender inequality. And we really need, you know, organizations to take the lead and start advocating for women, for mothers, for family friendly workplace practices, if we're going to see, you know, this absolute she session come to an end. How do we start then? I mean, that's a that's a massive question there. I mean, that's, you know, a shocking figure, that two million out of work in the US. How do we start to get those two million back into work? It's, you know, I followed the same theory of change based on my research. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, even though there's a lot of academic regulations that's behind it. It really involves three things. So I think, you know, most organizations are in denial about inequality. So we believe workplaces are meritocracies. They function for everybody in the same way because everybody is the same. But actually, you know, research finds success discriminates and it discriminates based on who most closely fits that 1950s ideal. So the challenge for organizations is to really think through you know, how do I create a work environment that values difference so if you're an employee who doesn't look like that 1950s male prototype you know how do you create an environment that you know is going to value your difference and your different capabilities and I think the challenge is for me a leader one. We don't have leaders who can create environments that value difference within your own team. You know, for you, for wherever you're working, you can create an environment where people feel included, people feel valued, people feel psychologically safe to be themselves. And that's what we need. You know, we went into a remote working environment under a crisis conditions and we gave leaders zero tools to make the transition from a transactional way of leading. That's why we're in the position today. We didn't invest in leaders. And so for me, how do you take this awareness raising where we're at now, where we understand this is a problem, we understand we need to fix it, companies are motivated to do so, and move to the second stage, which is understanding. Understanding how is this playing out in your work environment. So for you, Scott, you know, what are the challenges you face in work environments that don't value difference? What are some of the barriers that it's creating to your advancement and fulfillment? What about the women you work with? What are the challenges they're encountering day to day? Because my research finds without, you know, translating that awareness into a deep understanding as to how this is playing out in your work environment, it's very difficult for you to know how to take action. And that is why right now the awareness raising and disrupting denial that we're in is not translating into action because people simply don't know. The amount of leaders I've talked to and work with as part of the work I do who say, Michelle, I just don't know how to lead in an inclusive way. I'm just not sure what's being asked of me. Tell me what to do. And so, you know, this is really why we need to invest in our leaders, our managers and employees. You know, equality will be achieved when it becomes a practice, 
when it becomes the way leaders lead, employees behave, and workplaces work. That is the goal. And so to do that, we have to translate this awareness, this understanding into behavioral change, key actions. You know, you need to know how do I work in a way that's inclusive, that values difference, and that creates an environment where my colleagues feel like they can be themselves. And, the, you know, we'll know we're on this track when every individual can say, here's how a more equal environment serves to benefit me. You know, we need people to personally connect to this. You know, for me, in, in my case, a more equal work environment benefits me because I can be myself and I can share my talents and my capabilities. And so I'm motivated to create an environment that values difference. And that's really the key. Those three stages that organizations need to work through. I was talking to some colleagues recently and a mental health campaigner about mental health in the workplace. And they were saying that a lot of companies are not tackling these issues because they're frankly scared. They're scared to tackle them because they don't want to open the box on these. How do you remove the fear within companies to go, it's okay to start down this road? Well, you know, for companies that say that, and look, I, I don't want to sort of disregard the fear. The fear is real. I hear it a lot from men. I see it in research papers that show, you know, increasingly white men in particular are feeling scared, scared to mentor women, scared to go for lunch alone with women, scared, you know, on all fronts, scared around d topics, uncomfortable, bring it up. So we see this being a major barrier to, you know, actually doing the work and leaning into the discomfort and discomfort is part of the process. You know, you have to let go of this need to be a good person and step into examining your beliefs, examining your behaviors. I do it all the time and really trying to understand, well, you know, where am I in denial? Because we're all in denial to some extent. You know, I don't know what it's like to have a different mental and physical ability. I might not know what it's like to be a racial and ethnic minority woman, but I can learn. I can lean into my discomfort with these topics and really try and understand the barriers so that I know how to take action. So I think, you know, the fear is real. The challenge is, and I put this to everyone, not just sort of men, is that these changes are either going to happen to you or you're going to lead. And that's just the bottom line. And that's the same for companies. You know, organizations that have cultures of equality are simply going to be able to outcompete their peers. That's just the bottom line. Companies need innovation. Well, what do we know creates innovation? cultures of equality, another Accenture study showing that environments where you value difference and where people feel like they can be themselves, employees are six times more likely to have an innovation mindset. So getting over your fears is absolutely critical to surviving in the future world of work. And so for me, you know, the single most important thing you can do to future-proof your career is learn how to behave in a way that's inclusive, learn how to lead in a way that, you know, values difference and learn how to make your business business work in a way that, you know, serves a more diverse customer base, like that's absolutely the key. Because if you're not doing it, I can guarantee you, your competitors are, and you just simply won't be able to compete in the future world of work. That seems like a, a critical discussion to be having right now as we kind of emerge from coronavirus, because as we've seen in 2020, scores and scores and scores of companies who couldn't innovate um, die on the, and wither and die on the vine. As we emerge into the kind of the post-coronavirus landscape, and I know you've talked about this before, how important is it you know, for, for the future of companies to embrace what you're talking about here? And how can they do so? I think it's absolutely critical. And actually, you know, not to be the complete pessimist, I, you know, I do think there's an opportunity on the back of COVID to redefine organizational culture. So that is a positive, right? COVID really disrupted our way of working. And I think to a large extent has called time out on that transactional way of leading. In organizations like, wow, this really doesn't work in an environment where people are isolated. They're facing mental health chat challenges. They've got work life integration issues you know we need leaders who can coach who can provide feedback who can support employees and mentor and all of that you know remote working you cannot put a command and control way of working in a remote environment it just simply doesn't work you know people can just switch off zoom like you need you know you need leaders who can lead who can coach who can support and allow employees some of that opportunity to define how they want to work and how they're going to achieve results and so it's really created this business imperative, I think, to make the shift, right? If, if ever there was a business imperative, COVID's done it. And I think the post-pandemic workplace is going to look 
a lot different to, you know, the pre-pandemic workplace. And so the goal for organizations is to think through how do we use this opportunity to really redefine what it means to work in this organization and how we value each other, how we value our differences. I think it has also brought to the forefront that people bring their differences, their biases, their prejudices, their different identities into work. You know, when you come into your workplace, you're not just an employee, you're a person. And so we need leaders who can lead and manage individuals and understand how to create environments around that individual, how to meet that individual's needs. And these by and large just haven't had to do that. You know, they just pull a policy out and say, well, this is the policy. But that we know doesn't work in a COVID world and it certainly won't work in the post-pandemic workplace. So I think for me, what I'd like to see from organizations is what I call an integrated strategy for DNI that really looks at the policies, are they designed for difference? Have they really accounted for difference in terms of who you know needs their meeting? Your processes, so how do you hardwire inclusion across hiring, you know, promotion, reward, development, you know, all, all of your employee life cycle, all the processes that sit in that, how do you hardwire inclusion into that and help your leaders to become conscious of what they need to do to ensure they're valuing difference throughout that. But not just getting stuck there, which is where we've been today. Most organizations get stuck on those first two P's. These are Michelle's four P's of, of equality, by the way, Scott. Um, you know, it's really shifting the last two, which is what are the practices? What are the day-to-day -day behaviors we're engaging in? How do we create environments day-to-day? -day? You know, when somebody's in your team, what does that feel like? like? What is the experience of a black woman on your team? You know, are they going to be ignored? Are they going to be devalued? Do they have to work harder than other people? Are they going to be isolated? Are they going to face microaggressions? What is that day-to-day -day experience? And how do we create an environment that values difference every day and how do those three p's then serve to reinforce that prototype you know the goal for organizations with this work is to really try and shift from that 1950s way of leading to an environment that's value-based so leadership that's really you know very clear on what the organization values and leaders who behave in a way that represent those values and not just corporate values but i'm talking about practices you know are leaders showing curiosity are they collaborating do they have sort of the cultural competence to manage difference you know that's the shift that we need to make and that's a much more sort of transformational way of leading than what we have today I fear I know the answer to this question already, but you talk about transactional leadership. We're talking about a leadership model that's existed for more than 70 years. I mean, in almost every industry, innovation has gone, you know, through the roof. But it seems in, in this one segment, leadership, there seems to be very little innovation. Why? What's happening here? Well, so I normally get asked this and always have to sort of take a breath um, when I get asked it. But, I, you know, the question normally for me is, Michelle, we've had this 1950s model for forever. Why change? What's the point? Right. So I get asked this a lot. I work in a lot of male dominated industries like banking, oil and gas, mining. And that's the first question leaders will ask me. And I always appreciate the frankness, right? But um, the truth is it actually doesn't work. So yes, you know, you might advance in that environment, but research shows that, you know, for men who adopt that Don way of leading, they face tremendous challenges when it comes to male bullying, male silencing, mental health issues, depression rates, suicide. So, you know, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, that, you know, almost a whole other interview, but it is tremendously challenging to conform and feel pressure to conform and live up to this dominant, assertive, aggressive, competitive way of leading. And, you know, while that might have worked, there might be, you know, some people who could argue, look, that did work in the 1950s and it has maybe worked by and large in organizations that are hierarchical, that have clear roles and titles and responsibilities and that aren't diverse, right, where everyone looks the same. Yes, you can have one way of leading and working. That is not the work environment today. That is not the environment we're in today. And that is not the environment we're going to be in in the future. So what are some of the strategic bets you can make about the future world of work? Exactly to my point earlier on, you're going to work with people who don't look like you. You're going to work with technology. Uh, you know, that's going to require you to innovate in new and different ways. You're going to be serving an increasingly diverse customer base. And so all of those changes require a new way of behaving 
and a new way of leading. And so anybody who's interested about surviving in the future world of work, forget like the fact that this might have worked in the 1950s. It really doesn't serve us today and it won't serve you in the future. And so for me, it's absolutely an imperative that people start to see, hey, this is not about men and this is not about women. This is fundamentally about how do you make workplaces work for everybody? Because in that environment, you're much more likely to be successful. Um. One of your passion points I've seen is the next generation of women leaders and what the women need to know before they start work. Um, I'm kind of interested, as a father of a young daughter, does that process have to start early and at home? And what do I need to be teaching my daughter before she's even hit the schoolyard, you know? This is such a great question. Um, so I have researched this a lot in part with my role at UN Women and now working for Girl Up, the UN Foundations campaign. We actually run a program where we educate young women entering the workforce on the barriers they're likely to encounter. Uh, so to your question, you know, equality really does begin at home. So we see really from the, the age of around eight, and I've got some podcast episodes on this, um, you know, girls' confidence starts to really drop off. And that's because they start to notice the, work in, the, the school environment, the home environment values boys differently from girls and they start to really you know internalize some of that messaging so inequality and specifically gender inequality is really simple it's the fact that we value men and masculinity more than women and femininity the challenge when women and young girls experience that is they start to internalize it and this is exactly what my book points to in the first challenge women face entering the workforce is we gaslight young women by saying you know school life's going to represent work life and if you just work hard you'll succeed you'll get ahead that's absolutely not true telling young women that is completely unhelpful because what happens is they enter work environments where they presented with barrier after barrier like having to work twice as hard as their average male counterpart be seen just as good the pay gap actually affects women entering workplaces so they devalued from day one and we see this conformity bind in terms of not knowing how to show up in a way that manages sort of gender norms associated with being caring and sort of empathetic with the 1950s ideal way of leading which is dominant assertive aggressive so there's almost no right way to be a woman at work and there are tremendous penalties if you get it wrong and so, you know, those challenges, what happens is young women internalize them. And there's a statistic that I think motivates me every day to keep going with this work, which is that within the first three years of working life, young women's confidence in, in terms of their ability to advance to senior leadership positions, their belief that they can do that, drops by more than 60%. And that is a shocking statistic. And, and that's exactly why, you know, for women, they don't just go to work. They have to go to work every day and overcome invisible barriers in a work environment that says it's a meritocracy. It's the ultimate form of gaslighting. So for me, with young women and thinking about, you know, as a father, what can you do? Arm your daughters with awareness like prevent that internalization process. You know, I had so many editors say to me when I was writing my book, Michelle, we need actions. You know, we need specific things people can do. But awareness is an action. Being aware that actually this work environment doesn't value me and may never and is going to ask me to change who I am to fit in and then still not value me. And there are barriers and I have to learn how to navigate them and so that I can call them out for other women and women can support other women and men can support women and be allies to one another. That all requires a deep understanding of how inequality works. So educate your daughters. You know, yes, my book's one book, but there are plenty of other books out there, plenty of resources out there that you can, you know, as a father, give to your daughter and say, read these, please, before you enter the work environment so you can see things for what they are and recognize, you know, it's not you, it is your workplace. What's the one question I haven't asked you that you think I should ask you? Why do I do this work? You know, people sometimes ask me that. Um, I don't know. I think um, a lot of people don't know the story, but when I uh, first started researching this topic about 10 years ago, I really bought into the belief that I needed to be fixed, I needed to be changed. 
And as part of the PhD, you know, you have to go through this hideous review of the literature. And I remember sitting down with about 3,000 academic journal articles and just being totally confused because study after study showed that, you know, women are effective leaders. They're effective at networking. Both men and women read women as more effective managers. It just didn't make sense. I couldn't, couldn't make sense of the data that was in front of me. And so I decided to share this idea that maybe it's workplaces that need to be fixed, you know, maybe based on the literature I have, we can start to see that workplaces aren't, you know, hardwired to value difference. And actually, they systematically um, sort of filter out difference as, you know, women advance into leadership positions. And so I went to an, a conference in America in Pennsylvania thinking, you know, this might be a pretty small conference. I'll go and speak. Turns out it's the largest conference for women. And I was really nervous. I get up on stage and I share my message, you know, that we need to fix workplaces and not women. We need to create work environments where everybody can succeed. And I come off stage and there's this queue of women wanting to introduce themselves to me. And this one woman comes up to me and she puts her hands on my shoulders and she's got tears in her eyes. She's red in the face. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, what is she going to say? And she says to me, I'm going to put up on my wall at work what you said. And I was like, okay, what did I say? Um, and she said that I don't need to be fixed, that I'm good enough just as I am. And it was such an emotional moment because I think every single woman and I think a lot of men know what it's like to be feel like you can't be yourself and feel like you have to hide who you are and feel like you can't be valued. And I don't think we say this enough to everybody. You know, you deserve a workplace that values you just as you are. And so for me, this is really, how do we create environments where we are free to be ourselves? How do we access that freedom? You know, what can we do to value difference and how do we do that? And so I felt obliged at that moment to the world, which is why I went on to write this book, because I thought every woman deserves to know. And if you actually open the front cover of my book, you know, I dedicate it to every woman um, that they'll know just how truly exceptional they are. Because as I said, you know, we don't just go to work. We go to work and have to overcome invisible barrier after invisible barrier. And so my message to every woman with the book is just the starting point for this is recognizing it isn't you. Please stop fixing yourself. Please stop leaning in. Please stop doing all the things that workplaces tell you to do to change who you are, to fit into workplace environments that are never really going to value you, even if you do change. And so the goal here is to lean into your strengths, lean into who you are, lean into your values. And in doing so, you know, you're setting the standard, for resetting the standard for what good looks like in organizations and your companies will catch up eventually or they'll just go out of business. That's basically my view on it based on the data I've got. Um, and so, you know, change is coming. And I think that's the positive message here, whether companies like it or not. So, say, for example, and I hope I'm not, but who knows, um, I'm a 1950s transactional leader. I'm in a high rock company. I'm turning up every day and I'm living a lie, essentially. I'm not being myself as well. You know, every day I'm being this beast that is talking down to my team. How do I recognize that? How do I start to change? I think um, the starting point for this work, and by the way, I work with hundreds of you. You, you are my customers. Um, this metaphorical piece we're talking about, uh, you are my customer, is I think the starting point for it is disrupting your denial and becoming aware of how the more ways you fit that 1950s prototype, the more privilege you have, the more, the easier it is for you to fit into your work environment, the easier it is for you to advance, right? The more ways you differ from it, the more barriers or challenges you're going to experience trying to advance at work. That's the bottom line. That's how inequality works. And it's because those policies, those processes, those practices, those beliefs about what good looks like really serve that 1950s ideal, which is why, yes, as a white male, you absolutely have worked hard to get where you are. No one's taking that away from you. But what we're saying is you've just had to work hard. You haven't had to overcome additional challenges because of your difference. Your difference hasn't been an obstacle to your advancement at work. And so the goal is, you know, for 1950s prototype leaders is to think about, firstly, How's this showing up for me today and how's it making it easy for me to advance and maybe more challenging for my colleagues? So what are some of those ways that actually my similarity to this 1950s, what we call success prototype, 
you know, makes it easier for me. And then I think the second piece is realizing how does that not serve me today? So in an environment where that actually is no longer the standard of what good looks like, we need more inclusive leaders, we need more collaborative leaders, we need leaders who can manage difference. What are some of the ways in which I need to change? And for me, I really would hate any 1950s leader to start this work from a place of I'm helping women or, you know, I'm, I'm making it easier for you because you've got the challenges. I would want them to connect to it and recognize, actually, this is the requirement for me, like be able to finish the sentence, a more equal workplace serves to benefit me. Because that is the starting point for then doing the work to educate yourself, build that awareness and take action every day. So, you know, to really make that personal connection, I think, is the starting point for this work. And I have seen it. So in my own work, I really do see leaders going from zero to 100 on this work and leading the charge and building awareness, disrupting denial and, you know, enhancing understanding and taking action. I have seen it play out because I think once an individual connects like, hey, this is an imperative for me to be successful and maintain my position and advance in the future, you know, you're going to be personally motivated to do this work. And that's what's needed to sustain you through to taking action every day. Last question. Yeah. You look nervous, Scott. <laughs> no, I've just got so much going on in my head. I'm, I'm listening to you. Listening to me, there's so many great points. I'm interested though, you because you were saying you talk, you, you know, you have seen this, you've seen this in company, that sort of thing. You worked at Netflix, you know, which from the outside I would look multinational, very innovative company, a disruptive company that disrupted the workplace. Talk about the work that you did there as its director of inclusion. Were you able to take Netflix on a journey? Did it need to go on a journey? What were the things that happened there? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak specifically to Netflix because obviously, you know, that's that's their company information. But what I will say about Netflix and the culture that they have is it is highly innovative. It is transformational. But every organization is on their journey. You know, Netflix just recently published their inclusion report and they have made gains, but they also acknowledge there's a lot of room for improvement. And so I think, you know, for every organization, my, my position is there's no one organization that's doing this perfectly. That doesn't exist. And because it's a practice, I think too many organizations are looking at this wanting a gold star, wanting somebody to come in and be like, right, you're equal, you're inclusive, that's great. And that doesn't exist. It's never going to happen. Equality is like safety. I try and get people to think of it. If you've ever worked in oil or mining or any of those heavy industries, safety is a cultural practice. It's something people do. And as a result, it's just a continual process of renewing the practice, right? And, and making sure that, yes, your data, your scoreboard, your demographic data, your representational data, that gives you an indication of how you're tracking. But that's not the goal. That's an outcome of workplaces that value difference or workplaces that are safe and so for me the shift that needs to happen is this is not a one-off this is not hey we've done gender now we're done we're going to move on to race then we're done you know which in itself is just kind of racist and misogynistic you know the, the goal is to really think about how do each of us show up in a way that creates an environment that values difference what are the behaviors what are the practices we need everybody to engage in and how do we create an environment that values difference and what we see in the data is actually when you create the right culture, create the right environment, you see those gains on demographic um, representation. And that makes sense because you've now got an environment where, yes, you can not only bring diverse talent in, but they're likely to advance, they're likely to be succeed in that environment. And that's the goal. How do you create workplace environments that value difference? And so for me, that's the shift companies need to make. There's no gold star out there. Yes, some organizations are more advanced than others, but every organization is different because every organizational culture is different. So simply cut copying and pasting what one company is doing onto yours makes no sense. You know, everything is context specific. So it's about diagnosing what are the challenges in your environment. And there's simple things leaders can do to kick this off, right? I actually got an HBR article coming out specifically on this where I say, you know, just start talking to your people. Ask questions like, what does equality mean to you? How does inequality show up in our team? How will we know we're successful? What are some of the behaviors you need to see from me as a leader in order to create that type of environment? How do you need your colleagues to behave in a way that values difference? And then what are two to three things we can commit to as a team to start creating that environment this year? 
you know, just do that. Just go and ask those five or six questions and, you know, commit to two to three actions you can take. And I think if every team did that, if every manager did that, you'd start to see a shift in owning these issues. International Women's Day, I want to go back to my colleague and carry on that debate. Do you feel, do you feel that International Women's Day is helpful to the conversation? Is it something that we can have less around? Or is it a form of holiday which companies aren't paying in service to? I'm so sorry, Scott, you, you're cutting in and out. Um, but I think what I caught there is, is International Women's Day helpful to the conversation? Is that correct? Um, you know, I think raising awareness of, of gender inequality and where we're at, we've never needed that more than right at this moment, given, you know, um, just where we're at in a COVID world and all the losses we faced in terms of women's advancement in organizations, women in the workforce, the challenges with motherhood and working life. And so absolutely, for me, having an annual day that celebrates women, that celebrates the need for gender equality is critical. And precisely because of that first statistic you shared from the World Economic Forum about the gap and how long it's going to take. Um, you know, it, it's close to just under 200 years. I'm not that patient, Scott, and I don't know many women who are that patient. And why should we have to be that patient, right? So having one day a year where we get to raise awareness of the issues, we get to talk about it, is great. For me, I ask every single person, if you are recognizing International Women's Day, if you're celebrating it, make a commitment to take action. And, you know, there's zero excuse because I've given you a hundred of them. So every person can take action for equality. And I think committing to doing this so, even if it's just one action, is a starting point for changing what IWD is all about. Final opportunity. Recap those four Ps. Recap your four Ps for our audience. The four Ps. All right. These are Michelle's four Ps of, of inequality. So basically, as part of my PhD, I spent... 10 years studying how inequality shows up in organizations, what are the systems that create it? And it shows up in four important ways. One is your policies. So what are the policies you have in place, like flexible work, like maternity leave, like paternity leave? We see in organizations, the mere fact that you have to put a maternity leave policy in means that your organizations were never designed with women in mind, because if women had designed those policies, they'd look a lot different than they do today. The second is processes. So if you think about your employee life cycle, so the moment someone's hired, you know, they, they developed their succession plan, they promoted, they rewarded to the point that they're leaving. Those processes that underpin that employee life cycle, you know, how are they hardwired for inequality? So how do you hire in a way that really serves to benefit people who fit that 1950s ideal? What are your criteria like when it comes to succession planning? Are you only advancing people and developing people who fit the prototype? Research tells us that's the case. And, you know, when it comes to rewarding people, are we sort of valuing people who fit that 1950s ideal versus people who maybe show up in different ways? Again, research suggests that is the case. And so, you know, the motherhood penalty is a great example of that. And we don't have time to go into that today, but I encourage people to research that because it's a really good example of how we devalue mothers and mothers' contributions at work. And you're never further away from that 1950s ideal than when you're a mother. So, you know, really looking at that process process um, across the employee life cycle and how can you rewire it to value difference. You rewire it by getting your leaders to understand where inequality shows up and what they need to do. So becoming what I call a conscious decision maker, aware of the decisions you make throughout the employee life cycle and how that either serves to value difference or it doesn't. And then the, the last two P's are practices. So what are the day-to-day -day behaviors you're engaging as a leader? What are the behaviors you're rewarding, endorsing, and reinforcing within your own team that actually encourage people to live up to that 1950s ideal? So how do you actually value difference? So a quick example is, you know, organizations might have values, corporate values, and they might say, you know, we really want people to be curious, but then they give you one way of doing that which is being assertive in a meeting and dominant and asking questions. And that's actually reinforcing the 1950s ideal. So what we need is to let people demonstrate the values in a wide range of ways, you know, truly value difference. So for some people being curious might be sending an email, might be catching up one-on-one, -on -one. there might be other ways that they demonstrate it. So that's just an example of, you know, how we value difference in our day-to-day -day behaviors. And then I think all of that really serves to shift this idea of what good looks like. So the personal beliefs all of us have about what good looks like at work.
you know, I think for too long, DNI agendas have become associated with sort of left views. And that's not the case at all. I'm not here to sort of shift your beliefs that you have when it comes to religion or sort of any beliefs you have, right? But when you're in your work environment, the one belief that does need to shift is what good looks like in terms of leadership. And too many leadership teams that I work with are not clear on how they collectively need to show up. You know, what is the standard of what good looks like? What are the practices leaders need to engage in? And how do you do that in an inclusive way? So that's really that shift companies need to make from that 1950s ideal to what we call value-based leadership, where you're very clear about what good looks like in terms of a set of practices and you encourage your leaders to lead in a way that represents that and you reward, endorse, value, promote leaders who live up to that that ideal. And so that's really the goal in organizations, you know, having an integrated strategy when it comes to diversity and inclusion across the four Ps. Great. Uh, Charlotte, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.